Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring a section of this video. If you were to imagine a planet-wide hell, Venus would be pretty close. Its atmosphere is 90 times thicker than the Earth's, sulfuric acid rains down in the middle atmosphere, and surface temperatures are a scorching 464 degrees Celsius, pretty much everywhere on the planet's surface, from the equator to the poles, day to night. You would last longer on Mars without a spacesuit than you would on Venus with a spacesuit. We are constantly told that a doubling of the Earth's atmospheric CO2 concentration will result in a warming of between 1.5 and 4.5 and and degrees Celsius. Practically that means that if we add an extra 1.5 trillion tonnes of CO2 to our atmosphere, we can expect that the Earth will warm between 1.5 and 4.5 and degrees C. But assuming a warming of, say, 2 degrees Celsius for every 1.5 trillion tonnes of CO2 in its atmosphere, Venus, with approximately 463 quadrillion tonnes of CO2 in its atmosphere should be approximately 635,000 degrees warmer than the Earth, rather than the puny 430 degrees warmer that we observe it to be. Gentlemen, that's not acceptable. To work out why this is, we need to look at why Venus is the temperature it is. Work out why Venus is so cold. First of all, we quickly need to define a unit called a Kelvin, which is exactly the same as a degree Celsius, except absolute zero is zero Kelvin, rather than minus 273.15-ish degrees Celsius. Kelvin is a measurement of absolute temperature, or in other words, how hot something is relative to absolute zero. On this scale, Venus has an average surface temperature of about 740 Kelvin, while the Earth has an average surface temperature of about 288 Kelvin. Or in other words, Venus is is a little less than three times as hot as the Earth. Now, is that what we'd expect? Well, to answer that, we had to look at where Earth and Venus get their energy from, which is, of course, the Sun. Venus orbits the Sun at just less than three quarters the distance that the Earth orbits. The amount of solar energy received at a given distance from the Sun is given by an inverse square law. As you get close to the Sun, you receive much more energy. Because we can measure how much solar energy we receive here on Earth, about 1,370 watts per square meter, we can work out the total energy output of the Sun, and thus the amount of energy that Venus receives per square meter. This turns out to be almost twice as much as the Earth receives, about 2,600 watts per square meter. So shouldn't Venus be twice as hot as the Earth then? About 560, 570 Kelvin? Well, not quite. A planet reaches a certain temperature when the amount of energy it receives matches the amount of energy it radiates back into space, in a process we call black body radiation. The equation governing how much black body radiation it emits per square meter is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. Now if we set this equal to the amount of energy a planet receives per square meter from the sun, and account for the fact that the planet only receives this energy on its day side, but emits energy all over, all the time, we get an equation for the predicted temperature of the planet. Technically called the planetary equilibrium temperature. Plugging in the amount of energy that Venus receives from the Sun into this equation, we get a planetary equilibrium temperature of about 327 Kelvin, or 54 degrees Celsius. And this is the temperature we observe the top of Venus's atmosphere to be. The surface, however, is approximately 400 Kelvin hotter, which tells us that atmospheric processes must be causing the difference. But there are two components to those processes. Firstly, Venus's atmosphere is incredibly cloudy. In fact, only about 10% of the energy that hits the top of the atmosphere reaches the surface. Compare that to Earth, where about 75% of incident light reaches the surface. Accounting for this effect, what we call the planetary albedo, a measure of how reflective the planet is, the planetary equilibrium temperature plummets to a mere 162 Kelvin, or minus 111 degrees Celsius. Secondly, of course, there is the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere prevents black body radiation from leaving the planet. This means that less energy is radiated to space, while the same amount of energy comes in from the sun, causing the temperature to rise. According to our analysis, this greenhouse effect is responsible for about 560 Kelvin of warming, the difference between the planetary equilibrium temperature that we've just worked out and the observed surface temperature of Venus. So let's bring all of this together. Venus has approximately two 200,000 times as much CO2 in its atmosphere as the Earth did before the Industrial Revolution. And we're told that if we double the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, so add the amount that was in the atmosphere before the Industrial Revolution again, that we will experience about 2 degrees Celsius of warming. But our analysis on Venus indicates that it experiences maybe 0.0028 Kelvin of warming for every Earth's worth of CO2 in its atmosphere. 
So why is it then that Earth CO2 is pound for pound meant to cause more warming than Venus CO2? Well, the simple answer is that it isn't. This is the problem. Kind of. If you doubled the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere but kept absolutely everything else the same, the planet would warm by about 1 degree Celsius. And the reason this is so much more than the number we just worked out for Venus is because the greenhouse effect isn't a linear process. Starting with a planet that has no CO2 in its atmosphere at all, each Earth's worth of CO2, about 1.5 trillion tonnes, that you add to its atmosphere will cause a great deal of warming. So will the second. Keep adding trillions of tonnes of CO2, however, and each successive contribution will cause less and less warming. Venus has got so much CO2 that you could probably remove a significant fraction of its atmosphere, and its average temperature wouldn't drop by that much. It should be noted, however, that on Earth we are very much down here towards the start of this graph. CO2 causing warming is a nonlinear process, sure, but if you add CO2 to the atmosphere right now, you're still causing basically as much additional warming as if there were no CO2 present to begin with, because it's still such a small part of our atmosphere. However, the reason that doubling CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere is meant to cause between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees of warming, not just 1 degree, is because the CO2 has backup. It has family. Any warming caused by an increase in atmospheric CO2 also triggers a bunch of knock-on effects, a bunch of feedbacks, arguably the most important of which is an increase in the amount of water vapour held in the Earth's atmosphere. Warm air holds more water, and water vapour is a really potent greenhouse gas. And these feedbacks are actually predicted to cause most of the warming associated with a doubling in atmospheric CO2, but they're also responsible for most of the uncertainty around how much extra warming will take place. The CO2 on its own will probably cause about 1 degree of warming, but the feedbacks? That could be an extra half a degree of warming, it could be an extra 3.5 degrees of warming. This stuff is really hard to model. The takeaway here is that Venus is as cold as it is, one, because it has thick clouds that block out most sunlight, and two, because the greenhouse effect is non-linear, and Venus is so much further down the line than the Earth that any comparison between the two planets is basically meaningless. Venus not having feedbacks, especially those involving water vapour, also means that comparing the effect of CO2 pound for pound on the two planets just doesn't work. In conclusion, Venus is as cold as it's supposed to be, according to basic physics. Now let's try and focus on keeping Earth as cold as it's supposed to be. We already have one experiment in the solar system showing the effects of lots of CO2 in a planet's atmosphere. We really don't need a second. My target audience for these videos is people who like to question things, people who like to improve their understanding of the world around them through interesting examples. And if that sounds like you, I think you might really like Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is a website and app that lets you develop skills in maths, science and computer science through solving problems. It's designed to be a great resource to support classroom learning, but also be a standalone educational resource for curious adults. They have courses on a huge variety of subjects in STEM, including calculus, astrophysics, neural networks, and so many more. Crucially, these professionally written courses are based on solving problems rather than memorizing facts. They also have daily challenges to keep your brain cells engaged and expose you to a constantly evolving set of interesting subjects. I can personally recommend Brilliant because I've used it to brush up on my chemistry and my quantum mechanics knowledge, and I honestly really enjoyed my time spent using the website. The assets of each course are beautifully illustrated and the problems are really well thought out. You can check out Brilliant for free right now, and if you'd like to get access to their courses, then you can get yourself a premium subscription, or of course you can gift a premium subscription to someone, maybe a student in your life, and you can do that at brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. The first 200 people to go to that link will get a sweet 20% discount. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for continuing to support this channel. Thank you so much for watching the video, I really hope that you enjoyed this one, which was inspired by a bunch of comments that were left under some of my older climate change videos, basically going, but what about Venus? So it's a pretty simple argument to debunk, if you like, but I hope this was interesting and hopefully showcased a little bit of how climate physics works in action. As always, if you did enjoy the video, please do pop it a like, and let me know what you thought down there in the comments. Here's some recommended doing next, and that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one.